Um, we're talking about a very, very interesting story that ended tragically that involved this particular mill, the Howland Mill. The uh, story is about a man with a vision that uh, created something very special here for a very short amount of time, and that's going to be the essence of the walking tour. We're going to see the buildings that were built uh, in, that were very modest but very historically important, as it turns out. But I wanted to start in here to just give a little history of what it was like to work in the mills, what the history of the textile mills in New Bedford was, um, and then we'll go and start the tour on uh, Circuit Street. Um, New Bedford was late in coming to the textile industry. Um, as most of us know, Samuel Slater started the Industrial Revolution, really, in the United States when he set up his mill in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Um, and all the early mills that were developed in Lowell and, and on the Blackstone River Valley in Rhode Island and so forth, they all were built um, around water power. Um, they had a running, major running river nearby, and they harnessed that with those big wheels that you've seen probably in textbooks and so forth. Or if you've been to the Slater Mill, they actually operate the, one of the small mills with the water wheel still. And, um, and a tr tremendous industry developed here in New England. New Bedford didn't get involved in the textile industry early on for basically two reasons. Um, one of them was the fact that they were making so much money whaling that they didn't really want to do anything else. And the other one was that uh, they didn't have a water power source. But the technology of st steam engines developed rapidly um, in the 1820s and 30s. And by the 1840s, gigantic steam engines were developed to run mills of this size. And after that, um, all the mills that were built after the 1830s and 40s were based on steam engine, steam technology, and that's what New Bedford did as well. So the very first mill that was uh, built in New Bedford was the Wamsut successful mill. There were some small mills that, that failed, but the very first mill that was a very successful mill was the Wamsut mill. For those not familiar with the Wamsut mill, it's the big complex that's just to the east of Route 18 as you're coming in or out of the downtown area towards Route 195. And that was uh, built in the, in, and established in the late 1840s. Was, uh, it was very successful from day one, and um, uh, it continued to grow until the whaling, was, uh, the whaling industry petered out, and all that capital that had been accumulated in New Bedford from the whaling industry started to be transferred to the textile industry. And there was really plenty of money to, to start the industry here. And by the 1880s, early 1880s, New Bedford experienced a boom in mill construction. They started north and south from where the Wamsutta is located now. There were mills built to the south, all on the waterfront, and to the north. And, by, and, and William, D, William D. Holland was one of the men that got involved in this business. I'll talk specifically about Holland in a minute. And he built this mill here, in um, this particular mill that they were standing in, in 1889. Now, so that's the history to that point. Um, we were in the middle of a boom period, mill construction, mill production, and it, all um, cotton products for the most part. There was some dalliance in silk and wool, but primarily in New Bedford it was a cotton town. And the textile industry in New Bedford did two things very well and two things only. They got raw cotton spun it into thread, or yarn as they called it then, in the early days, and then they wove that spun cotton into cloth. That's basically what the mills did. They didn't do any finishing, they didn't do any of the dyeing, they didn't do any of the other stuff. They, they made a basic product and it was sold to other people for the finishing. Um, the Bedford never did any of that type of dyeing and so forth, which, which was done, was, was plenty of other places in Rhode Island, and even in Fall River did a lot of finishing as well. Now this mill here, as I mentioned, outside to, to a few, all of the Howland mills were just spinning mills. They didn't do any weaving at all. Every inch of this particular floor, and the three floors in this building, and the three floors in mill number one, which I'll talk about when we go outside again, were filled with spinning machines. They took the raw cotton and processed it. It's a very complicated process, which I really, really quite don't understand yet. But they would, uh, uh, they would go from these balls of cotton. Remember, cotton fibers only 
uh, inch and a half to two inches, sometimes only half an inch to two inches long. And they come in this tight, very tight by cotton balls that you can still buy. And that all had to be processed to make hundreds and hundreds of yards of thread. Um, and by the time the 1880s came along, it was pretty much a standard procedure. But in this particular mill, and all the mills, all the mills that were built during this time, no matter where they were built, were built in the same manner. They had these long shafts. I don't think this is one of the original shafts. That's a water shaft. But it looked, the shaft was about that wide, the one right on top of this roof here. And a series of shafts would go, probably in this particular mill, there'd be three shafts. And on those shafts were connected to the steam engine, and those shafts rotated. They put leather belts on those shafts and connected them to the spinning machines or the, or, the, or the looms, depending on what you use. But in this particular case, they were spinning machines. And that's what drove this, the machines. So every single one of the machines on this, on this particular shaft, which would go on, there might have been two shafts, it probably might have been even just one, well, probably this is a pretty long mill, probably two shafts in this particular mill building. And when one of the machines went down, for one reason or another, the whole, all of them went down. You had to stop the whole thing. And that's how it worked. And, would, and if you had to have a very good reason, and probably the individual operators of the machine, of probably a series of machines, could stop the whole line. But they did so at the overseer's extreme ire at the time. This was very, it was a very difficult um, a pr a job for the, for the operatives. But that's what they did here. And as you can see, this, this mill has been really beautifully rehabbed and repurposed, really, for other, for other uh, reasons. And if you go into, like, um, the um, Kushnet River Antiques, which is pretty much the same as it was, and some of the old, if you've been in the Kilburn Mill during the, the time when the panorama, the Whaling Museum panorama was on display, you could see what it was really like. You know, none, of the, none of the equipment's there anymore and so forth. But if you would see, when you do see pictures of the mills during those years, it's packed. You could not fit another inch of machinery in, in the floors here when they were in full operation. I tried to count initially and I got about 50. I was wrong. A lot. So I'm going to be yelling. Um, the mill right behind us is uh, mill number one, built in 1888, actually just a year before the one we were in. It's a little bit, actually it's quite a bit smaller. It's about half the size of the one we were just in, but basically the same layout, the same products, the same everything. Um, but this is where I want to introduce you to William D. Howland. William D. Howland was the mastermind of the project. Um, he was born in 1853 here in New Bedford to two very, very important New Bedford residents. One of them was Matthew Howland, who was a very well-known and a successful whaling merchant. And his wife and William's mother was a lady by the name of Rachel Howland, one of my favorite people from New Bedford, actually. I talked about anybody who came to the tour last week. This is the same Rachel Howland that I talked about last week. She was a um, very, very important uh, activists, social activists on a whole range of issues, mostly women's issues, but not exclusively so. She was a very well-known uh, Quaker uh, preacher. Um, the, both the Howlands were very strict Quakers. They did not uh, uh, leave the meeting when they had problems with the religion in the early parts of the, of the 19th century. Um, they were very strict Quakers, Quakers very, very successful. Um, they spent a lot of money on philanthropy, setting up, they built a church for, for uh, the, the, um, the mill, mill people at, the, how, at the, uh, the Wamsutter Mill. They did lots of good things. It was all led by Rachel. So that was his parents. One very, very interested in making money and adept at making money. And his mother, who was very, very socially conscious and acted upon those convictions. So kind of an interesting a uh, combination of uh, maybe skills that he brought to this to this site. Howland went to the Friends Academy, graduated from Brown University uh, in um, 1872, and started working. He decided though he wasn't going to follow in either one of his parents' footsteps. He was going to make his mark 
in textiles. He worked five years at the Wamsutter Mill learning the business. Then he took a year off and traveled around to see other mills and how they, how they operated. And then decided to set up, to set up his own little cotton mill, <coughs> which he did um, on land that his, his father owned at the foot of North Street. His father was um, a very successful whaling mer merchant. He had his own wharf on, on, at the foot of North Street, and he owned land uh, on, the, on a few blocks up from, on, from North Street himself. And the whaling business of the Howlands took a very, very bad turn in the 1870s. In fact, they lost so much money in two successive disasters in the Arctic where they were whaling at the time that uh, Matthew and Rachel really were living uh, off their creditors' uh, goodwill by the time the late 1870s came. So William was maybe doing a little bit of the family a favor by buying, he bought the, the, the site on North Street and he built a little mill called the New Bedford Manufacturing Association, uh, uh, New Bedford Manufacturing Company. And uh, um, it was completed in 18, 1882 and it was successful. He made some money. And the investors that he, that he uh, convinced to, to help him with the mill were some of the most important people in New Bedford, the Roach family and the Clifford family, um, especially the Roaches. The Roaches had, still had a lot of money. William J. Roach was one of the wealthiest uh, men in, um, in New Bedford, and he was the financial backing for the, uh, the New Bedford Manufacturing so, uh, Company. With that, it, uh, uh, encouragement and the amount of money he was making he decided to, to go on this grand scheme and basically without beating it to death he bought 150 acres in this area of New Bedford basically from Rivet Street to all the way to Dartmouth Street and down to Orchard Street as well and even out to Cove 150 acres of land and he was going to build this massive industrial residential uh, property um, on it. But it was going to be a little bit different than your typical residential property. He was going to um, do his best, his best job in, in creating housing and living environment for his, his workers as he possibly could. And that's what he tried to do here. And that's what we're going to see in a few minutes. Um, all of these mills that were built, no matter where they were in New England, when you built a mill like this, you automatically had to provide housing for at least 100 to maybe 300 people, right out of the box. They needed some place to live. They weren't close to areas where there was a lot of housing because they were all spread out in areas that were unoccupied. This particular section of New Bedford, when Howland bought it in 1886, was virtually empty. There was nothing out here but, but abandoned farms and nursery land. Um, there was, the Bolton Street did exist, but nothing else existed out here. Um, and the same thing with the new mill. So they, you always had to provide housing when you built a new mill. And the housing they built was usually of the poorest quality and even worse maintained. And he wanted to, he wanted to uh, uh, break that mold and develop something that would be pleasing and, 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 and human to the workers in the mill. And that's what he did. And behind us, is the Howland Mill Village. 25 houses built when this building was built and another 25 houses when mill number two was built. Now, there's no way that everybody who worked in the mill could have lived in the houses because they had too many employees. That mill probably started out with 150 people and that probably started out with 250 people and there's no way that these, these houses could, could supply 500 uh, units of, of living. They were single family houses. But it was a good start, and the other, there were plenty of people that they recruited to work in the mill from the area just south of Orchard Street and Rivet Street, so that's probably where the rest of the workers came from. So he built this great village, uh, made it affordable. The village cost $100,000 to build, and the infrastructure for the, for the uh, village cost another $38,000 because they had running water, hot and cold running water, they had um, sewer systems, they had a few little roads, the two roads that we're going to see, we're going to walk on, they were built as well at the time. 
and they had to build a road at the back of the mill as well because the Jenkins Street did not exist. There was nothing there. Nothing existed at the time. The rents for the village were eight for the five-room cottages, eight dollars a month for the five-room cottages, and ten dollars a month for the seven-room cottages. Now you have to realize that the weekly rate wages at the mills were five dollars a week to fifteen dollars a week. Five dollars a week for 56 hours. That's a standard work week at the mills. No matter where you went, that was the standard work week until World War II. 56 hours a week. 10 hours and 10 minutes a day and five hours and 10 minutes on Saturday. But nonetheless, there was an equal uh, distribution of the wage earners in the, in the village. It was really revolutionary. People were really, you know, this was a model uh, mill housing at the time. Uh, it was written up in papers across the country, actually. And uh, the city was very proud of it because, you know, when there was strikes and there were strikes constantly, and that was one thing the Howland wanted to avoid at all costs was an adversarial relationship with the, with the workers. So, um, so this is, what he, this is how he tried to solve it, one of the reasons how he's going to solve the problems. You had to, you had to work for the mill to, to rent one of the properties. They took the, wage, they took the rents out of your wages. You could sublet. You could sublet your house, actually. They allowed that. And they would also allow you to buy property because they owned, when we go to the end of the property, everything towards Dartmouth Street was owned by the, the corporation. It was vacant and stayed vacant for a long time. Um, you, they would, they, you could buy a lot and build your own house if you wanted to. They were very, very generous about housing and, and so forth. So that's what, that's what, it, what we did, what he did here. We're going to walk up right here in a minute. There are four, four distinct designs in the village. There were seven, there was 15 five room, you can tell probably by the size, which are the five rooms, and 35 seven rooms. There's four different styles. There's a, uh, a the traditional gable end. There's a, there's a, uh, a jerkin head or clip gable end. There's the, um, the gambrel end. And then there's the, the colonial gambrel, like a, like a cape style gambrel. And there's three of them in the very first, on our very first start. This house right here is exactly like it looked in 1895. Somebody did a, the government actually did a survey of mill housing in, in New England. And they did this, they did this project um, in spades, actually. And they, did a, they drew a picture of one of the houses, and this is the one they, well, they didn't draw this exactly, they, this, but it looks just like this. The, Dormers are a little bit different on the ones, but the porch is the same, everything's the same. So this house here, even though it looks brand new, kind of, this is what they look like. This is what it looked like when it was built. You've done a nice job of keeping it up. This one here also looks pretty much exactly the same as when it was built. This is called the jerkin head end or the, or the clip gable end. Um, there's quite a few of these uh, on the five, the five room uh, size. The one across the street, the red one, that's the gable end. That's the third of the styles. Um, we'll, and the white one, you see the white one up the street here? That's the, gable, that's the gambrel end. It's like intersecting gambrels. Um, so they repeat, there's a little, there's differences in each one of the houses. They're not all exactly the same. For instance, like some of the dormers are, have the clipped gable like this does in, in the front of the house. So there's a little bit of variation on many of them. And you can see there, there's somewhat, somewhat randomly placed on the street to make it more like a park-like setting and less formal and less undesirable as it were. But, it's, but that's pretty much how they're set up. Yes? How many families was in a place like this? How many One. people? One family. One family. They had full basements, as I mentioned. They had uh, uh, most of them, the bathrooms on the second. They had just had, they were nice little houses. They had full basements, concrete basements, hot and cold running, running water, and uh, sewer, they were connected to the sewer system. This house here was, the, was called the tenement or boarding house for the mill. This was built by, as part of the, the village. Now, it wasn't always situated here, though. It was on the corner, along with three other houses, of Rock, the northeast corner. This was right on the corner of Rockdale and Bolton, where we were. 
This was right on the corner. This was a tenement house or boarding house for the male, single male workers. Try as I may, I couldn't figure out how many people this house would, would actually um, hold, but probably at least 10 or 15, what would you say? It had nine apartments. Nine apartments? Yeah. All right, so 10 or 15 probably. Uh, it's been modified greatly. Um, they, these two towers in the front are, I guess, I'm not sure what they, they the stairwell, mm -hmm. probably the stairwell now. But this house here was, the, was part of the village, but it was moved here probably around 1915. Um, they built the weave, sh the next owners of, this, of the mill built the weave shed where the Siabra is and so forth um, at that site. And I think they probably demolished the, the little houses because the, there's about 47 or 46 that still, that still stand and there's three or four missing. That probably lost three of those, but they did move the tenement house to this location. When you look at historic photos, there's a lot of historic photos of the, of the site. Um, and you can see this building is clearly the tenement building that was moved. It's been modified somewhat, but the design is very, very similar to the other houses in the village. Um, and it's, it, doesn't look, it looks like it's out of, a little bit out of place here, but it actually is part of the village um, that was built um, in the first round of buildings in 1888. One of the things that, uh, they, that Holland did for the employees was take them on an excursion to Martha's Vineyard every summer. He chartered a steamboat. Matter of fact, they even in this article I told you about the 60,000 pounds, they also talked about this, uh, <clears throat> this, this benevolence of, of paying for chartering a steamer and bringing as many people as he could to, Nan to Martha's Vineyard for an outing. And they had scheduled picnics and ball games and bicycle races and all kinds of things. Food, they even had a band on the ship so they could play music on their way out there. They identified the ship actually in the article. And it's a ship that you could find online. And it was a pretty big steamer. I don't think it would have held more than three or 400 people, but um, maybe more than that. But anyway, for three years running, actually four years running, uh, you know, he used, he went on this, uh, skirt, he rented a steam, chartered a steamer, a huge steamer, like a four of a line boat. If anybody's ever seen a four of a line boat, one of those types of steamers that he took everybody who wanted to go to Martha's Vineyard for the day. So, so what happened? Well, they built the, um, the, the third mill on this site called the Road Spinning Mill, 1892. Everything was going great, making money. Everybody was happy, but then in 1893, one of the cyclical recessions in American economic history took place called the Panic of 1893. All the recessions in the 19th century were called panics of something or other, the year that they happened. And they were about every 20 years. There was one in 1837, 1857, 1873, and 1893. And what happened in these recessions is like what happens in all recessions. Like when we had the, the, the mortgage recession just a few years ago. People lose their jobs, people you know, stop buying stuff, the economy goes south, everything is bad. And that's what happened here. Um, the, the panic hit New Bedford, um, they decided to cut wages by 25%. Now what, how they cut wages in, in, in the textile era was they actually reduced hours, reduced your opportunity to make product. They called it curtailment cut down. And that's what they did. They proposed a 25% reduction in hours. And there was a resulting strike in 1894. Now there was a, an association of mill owners called the New Bedford Manufacturers Association. And they, because all the mills basically were one mill as far as policy and price and wages and everything was concerned. It was the, the era of the interlocking directorate. So everybody was on everybody else's board. Everybody was on everybody else's bank board. It was a total control of the industry meant for two reasons, two reasons control and risk uh, uh, avoidance. That's basically why. So 
But the conflict of interest, of course, obviously, all that has been outlawed now because of conflict of interest. But in those days, that didn't exist. And so the Manufacturers Association got together, declared the cut down, the workers went on strike. Now, William D. Holland wasn't at the meeting where the strike was, was, was where the cut down was voted on. And so he held out and he said, well, I'll close for, it was like a Wednesday or something like that. And he said, well, I'll close for the next couple of days. I'm going to think about it. Um, and he decided that he wasn't going to close. He was going to continue the hours and wages and production that they had been doing. Um, and they didn't sit well with everybody, but it, that's what happened. The problem with that strategy was the, the recession went on and on and on. He continued to pay high wages. And if you're paying high wages, or not high wages, the, the prevailing wage, you also have to pay dividends to the shareholders because that's what they expect. You know, if you're paying them, we get money, we, we get money first, then, you, then they get money. So he continued to borrow secretly to keep the mill running, to keep his employees happy, and to perish, and, and also to pay the shareholders. Well, you can't do that forever. And the, the, the recession dragged on and on. By the time 1897 came along, he was desperate. He had to have been so desperate. He went to the bank, where he was a director, and his father had founded, and said, I need another $200,000. And they said, no way. And we want to see your books right away. Because there was you know, rumors that there was something up. And he knew at that point, he must have been on an, under enormous pressure. He had a wife and two sons. And when he was declining the bill, he knew that the mill was going to fail. Not only was the mill going to fail, the bank was probably going to fail as well. He leaves the meeting with his accountant. The accountant sees that Howland is really distressed. He says, don't do anything rash. And Howland says, I won't. He walks to his dock at the foot of North Street and drowns himself. The, the mill fails. The bank fails the next year. Hundreds of thousands of dollars are lost. The estimates of how much he was in debt range from, from uh, half a million to almost a million dollars. They had assets of only like $100,000. The mill failed. The mill was, was taken over in receivership by the, by the New Bedford Manufacturers Association. They ran it for a couple of years uh, under those terms. A big giant holding corporation, which they got from out of town, came and bought the assets of the mill, uh, looking for a buyer. And then the mill, and then the economy picked up in around 1900, 1901. The mill was sold to a, a, another organization, and they renamed it the Gosnold Mill. And it was very successful as the Gosnold Mill, actually. Um, but um, the legacy of, of the benevolence was lost, unfortunately. And the thing is, if he had just been patient, if he'd gone with the cut down, and maybe he would have, could have re reduced rents or done anything else to keep the mill solvent, uh, because if he had just waited until, the, until it turned around, they would have been rolling in the money again, because the high, the high point and the real profitable time in New Bedford was just ahead. Thank you all for your